As with many other Indian tribes, nations, and confederacies, the name by which the Iroquois became known to the European settlers was not the name they gave themselves, but a name given them by other Indians, and transformed as it passed into European languages. As often happened, it was a pejorative name, the Killer People, in the language of the Algonquin Indians, subsequently transformed by Basque speakers, and then transformed again as the name passed from the Basques to the French, to emerge as Iroquois, pronounced differently by the English and the French. The Iroquois were not a tribe, but a confederation, encompassing the Mohawks, the Senecas, the Cayugas, the Oneidas, and the Onondagas, and later the Tuscaroras. It was also known as the Five Nations, and then as the Six Nations, after the Tuscaroras joined in the early eighteenth century, spread from east to west across what is today New York State, and extending over into Canada and the northern fringe of Pennsylvania, these nations shared a family of languages used by other Indian nations, including the rival confederacy of the Huron farther west, the Susquehannock nation to the south, and the Cherokees farther south. The Iroquois Confederation gradually took shape from a coalescing of villages, and then clusters of villages, into larger and larger political units, sometime between the middle of the fifteenth century and the early decades of the sixteenth century. This alliance formed to put an end to long and ruinous warfare among the tribes who finally came together to form the confederation. In contrast to the autocratic rule of the Aztecs and the Incas, the Iroquois confederation was one based on mutual agreement for any confederation-wide action, though individual nations within the confederation might, for example, engage in war with an external enemy on its own, provided that this did not harm other member nations. In practice, however, warfare sometimes did nevertheless break out between Confederation members. Among themselves, the Iroquois were known as the people of the Longhouse, based on their distinctive dwelling places. Several nuclear families would inhabit a wooden building about twenty feet wide and more than a hundred feet long, each family in its own cubicle and sharing hearths with an adjoining family. The collection of such longhouses would be surrounded by a palisade as defense against military attack. Such towns or villages might contain as many as two thousand people, and the entire Iroquois Confederation contained perhaps thirty thousand people. Located inland from the first European settlements, the Iroquois were close enough to make such contact as they needed for trading purposes, but not close enough initially to suffer the devastating epidemics of European diseases that struck other tribes adjacent to the white settlements, nor were their lands initially in immediate peril of being taken over. Moreover, the Iroquois were strong enough for the settlers to want to make peace and alliances with them. Indeed, as the Iroquois acquired firearms, they became more formidable to other Indian nations and confederacies, particularly to the Hurons and the Mohicans both of whom were eventually devastated by wars launched by the Iroquois. In Iroquois society, as it existed when the white settlers first arrived, the men were hunters and warriors, while the women farmed, performed domestic chores, and made clothing from deerskins. This farming was, as elsewhere, without the benefit of draft animals, and therefore without the animal manure used to maintain fertility in other parts of the world. This meant that the Iroquois found it necessary for the Iroquois to move to new locations every few years, as the fertility declined on a given expanse of farmland. Dependence on deer skins for clothing likewise meant that a modest number of Iroquois required a vast amount of land in which to hunt the deer required to keep themselves clothed. The Mohawks, for example, with an estimated population of less than 8,000 people, controlled an area with more than 75,000 deer of whom about a third could be culled annually without threatening the herds with extinction. As with the Iroquois Confederacy, so within its constituent nations, and even down to the individual longhouses, consensus was the mode of decision-making. As villages relocated, dissenters could split off to form their own communities, thus avoiding the internal strains of more hierarchical societies. Such social arrangements, as well as dependence on large deer populations and shifting agricultural sites, all required a very large expanse of land to support what would have been a relatively modest number of people by contemporary European standards. Such a way of life was not conducive to urban civilizations, such as those of the Aztecs and Incas, or of Europeans and Asians.
although consensus and often unanimity were required for group decisions among the Iroquois, with chiefs having only such authority as was accorded them by their people for the purpose at hand, relations among the nations of the Confederation were by no means always equal, and relations between the Confederacy and other Indians were far from harmonious. Although equals were called brothers among the Iroquois, the Mohawks, Senecas, and Onondagas were considered elder brothers to the Oneidas, Cayugas, and Tuscaroras. Warfare between the Iroquois and their enemies involved not only the carnage of battle, but also sadistic tortures of captives, which might be prolonged for hours or even days, until death finally ensued. Sometimes ritualized cannibalism was also practiced. However, not all captives were tortured or eaten by any means. It was the men of the opposing tribe who might suffer this fate, as well as enslavement, but women and children were simply taken prisoner and usually absorbed into the conquering tribe. So were many men, depending on the needs for population replacement, especially after large losses due to warfare or to epidemics. However, prisoners brought back to the visitor's village could expect to be forced to run a gauntlet, in which even the women and children of the victorious tribe would beat or stab them. Women who had suffered losses of family members could revenge themselves by torturing captives, or might choose to adopt them instead as replacements. Later, European missionaries could likewise suffer death, mutilation, or enslavement, or might succeed in winning converts to Christianity. Trade with the European settlers began to change the Iroquois way of life in various ways from the early colonial era onward. Cloth quickly became a substitute or supplement to deerskin clothing, so that even the earliest drawings of Iroquois people seldom showed them in their authentic, traditional dress as it existed before contact with the European settlers and their cloth. Copper kettles from Europe were also preferred to the indigenous earthenware pots, and iron and steel cooking utensils, knives, and arrowheads were likewise preferred to their own indigenous counterparts. Above all, firearms crucially changed the balance of power between the Iroquois and other Indian nations without such ready access to the new weapons. Moreover, as the use of firearms spread, the Iroquois abandoned their wooden and leather body armor, which had been useful against arrows but not against bullets, and now opted for the greater mobility permitted by no longer carrying this additional weight. Even the wampum so much identified with North American Indians began to be made with European tools and changed in character as a result. European arms and European alliances became crucial to the outcomes of wars among Indians, so that the Iroquois, among others, became, increasingly over time, satellites or clients of the white settlers, without the formality of conquest in most cases. At the same time, the rivalries among European powers made the Iroquois valuable allies in the power politics and repeated outbreaks of warfare among the French, English, and Dutch. Over time, the Iroquois' domain expanded and contracted with the changing fortunes of war and power politics among Indians. Alliances shifted over the years, both among Indians and between particular Indians and particular groups of European settlers. It was considered a fundamental principle of Iroquois diplomacy to regard no treaty as settling anything once and for all. Later, they would discover that many white authorities took the same view, to the detriment of the Iroquois. As firearms began to spread among rival Indian peoples, the Mohawks lost their initial military advantages around the middle of the 17th century. The Mohicans and the Ottawas defeated them in 1662, and they failed to defeat the Susquehannock or the Delaware Indians the following year. Their raids against the Algonquins in Massachusetts provoked retaliatory raids against Mohawk settlements that continued for a decade. The ascendancy of the British in North America, as they drove out the Dutch and battled the French, represented for the Iroquois in general and the Mohawks in particular both the loss of their Dutch allies and the strengthening of their Indian enemies by the British. However, the British and the Iroquois eventually concluded an historic alliance called the Covenant Chain, which provided a framework for peaceful settlement of their differences and established, as the British saw it, a claim to vast expanses of land from New England to the Carolinas and westward to the Great Lakes, since the various Iroquois nations had raided and made claims, of varying degrees of authenticity, to sovereignty over this region while the British saw the alliance as establishing British sovereignty over the Iroquois. 